Hello and welcome to IR Thinker, where international affairs are discussed. I'm Martin Zupko. Today we are having a very special topic for debate, for the interview. We're going to deal with a proposal for a new Russian constitution. Today I'm joined by Peter Safrano. Hello, Peter. Hi, Martin, and hello to everyone who is viewing us. Peter is a philosopher education researcher and artist. He is currently a guest researcher at the University of Amsterdam. In recent years, he has mostly worked on multidisciplinary initiatives at the intersection of science, educational design and art with the Oxford Russia Foundation, the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, ed tech firms, private schools and social entrepreneurs. Peter publishes on philosophy, education studies, and history in both Russian and English. So I was browsing a link in and, and I found a new proposal for the Russian constitution, which immediately got my attention. And on the second page, there is this passage. Drafting a new constitution is a part of an effort to articulate a vision of a common future to the Russian citizens. The proposed draft doesn't seek to close the debate on the constitution. It indicates a possible approach, one position in the constitutional debate. This position is based on a Republican political philosophy, which thinks of politics as a common cause for the citizens of the state. So that's very interesting statement. It's a very interesting project. So, Peter, let's speak about this. Why was this process, this project, this draft initiated? And what was the driving force behind it? Well, I would say that the driving force was precisely um, to understand what we can do, uh, what we can do collectively as, as, as Russian citizens in order to prevail the current climate of impunity or even outright neglect to the rule of law, which is uh, currently reigning in, in, in Russia. So that's that's the basic reason. And uh, secondly, uh, my personal thinking is that if, if you want to, to do something, you can only do it on your own. So if you want to understand how to make a constitution, and if you want to actually grasp uh, what should be regarded as, as, as legal, as basic legal provisions, for a sustainable state order, then you have to try it yourself. And that is what, what we did, me and my colleagues. Right. So when you say me and my colleagues, does it mean people in Amsterdam? I mean, the University of Amsterdam? Or it's international? Like more people are joined from different parts of the world? Uh, I'm referring to a group of people scattered all around the world, some of them in England. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of them in the United States, and some of them in Russia. And for that reason, I'm not ready to disclose their names. But yes, that's a pretty, I mean, sizable bunch of people from all over the world who are, for that reason, for that or any other reason, interested in developing draft for for new Russian constitution. We don't want names, but what sort of professions are those people? Are those people lawyers, scholars, philosophers? Myself, I'm a philosopher by training. And I've uh, did, and I'm still doing lots of work in the field of political philosophy. I've also uh, been joined by legal scholars and lawyers, obviously, especially when I've been preparing this English translation of uh, of the draft, which we're currently discussing. Because, yeah, surely I do need lots of help from people who are professional lawyers in order to uh, not to be lost in translation, so to say. The base, as, as we said, is Republican political philosophy. So the question is, what role does this Republican political philosophy play when constructing a constitution? I guess it has a lot to do with my critical stance towards uh, the, the current neoliberal climate, which rather aggressively pushes forward hyper-individualisms in, in all spheres of life and uh, in politics as well. So this is not... Uh, something that is specifically connected to Russian situation, that's a problem all over the world. We're having now highly polarized societies with deeply, with I would even say desperately individualized understanding of uh, rights 
and duties. So when we're talking about republicanism, we're saying about replacing this hyper-individualism with the idea of collective right and collective action by citizens, for citizens, and with citizens. I see. That sounds like something innovative, you know, for the for the constitution drafting. But before we jump to the draft, let's speak a little bit about the current Russian constitution. And can you highlight some some good sides or strength and some weaknesses? You know, because people will automatically ask, why are we drafting a new constitution if there is a constitution already? The, the Institute of Presidency was, uh, so to say, hyper-boosted in the text of constitution. So now the executive powers are basically enjoying no autonomy, apart from like playing the role of uh, second-hand uh, servants of, of, of the president. And this is basically the main reason of crafting a new constitution. I mean, uh, trying to balance the hyper-inflated uh, power of one man, the president, by by the power of uh, legislative uh, institutions. Uh, and, and the second reason is probably that uh, current constitution deliberately downplays the importance of federalism. And Russia is obviously a huge country, and when all resources and all taxes are coming to one center, which is located in Moscow, that is obviously a reason for huge disparities. So in a way, we've been crafting a constitution that would decentralize or decenter what might be reasonably called uh, an empire, despite the fact that uh, on paper, Russia now is not an empire, but in terms of mechanisms that are there, it is still very imperial uh, kind of state. Officially, Russia is, you know, Russian Federation. But, yes, uh, and, but... that's, and that's the problem, because officially there's a federation, but the level of uh, unity and the level of centralization is so high that many people, both inside and outside uh, Russia, they reasonably doubt whether it is the point of any point in calling current Russian state a federation at all. Right. So, so basically, as for my students to understand, even Russia is federation officially. The main center of this federation is one city. The regions have some competencies, you know, still for the main projects and everything which is, which is really important for people. You need a blessing from Moscow. Am I correct? The, 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 the manner of decision making is top down. So, uh, and, and, and the top and center is firmly located in Moscow, Kremlin, right? As it was in Stalin times. When we take the current constitution of Russia, what's the integration of this constitution in the Russian legal system? Can we compare the Russian constitution position in the legal system with something as we have in Europe, or it's, it's different? Yes, we can. And the current Russian constitution, as, as you say, was adopted uh, uh, 30 years ago, in 1993, it is a combination of American and German constitutions, mainly. So uh, it is trying to play the role of what is called in German Grundgesetz, so the basic law. But the thing is that after adoption, it was many times amended during the last 10 or 15 years. In all these amendments, they actually so to say, wiped away all judicial authority or legal authority, which was initially attached to the text of constitution. Because now it's obviously just an instrument for a very narrow group of people, or, or even for one person, Mr. Putin himself, to just hold his power forever. I think it's good to take a holistic approach to Russia especially after what we have seen recently, because I think many people, and it's, it's all right, you know, when they focus on certain issues, but have a constitution as a draft, that's a holistic approach to change, not the direction of the country, but also the principles, the principles that the country is run upon. So 
with the new draft, what sort of principles do you have? And can we elaborate a little bit why those principles? Because, you know, during the process of drafting, you had to decide what you will put in the new constitution and, and you had to work with some sort of principles. Yeah, th thank you for this question, because indeed it was very important for all the group of, of, of developers, so to say, uh, to be very keen on what kind of values and principles we'd like to, to put forward in this draft. And uh, basically these are three things, I would say. This is self-governance, citizen self-government, built in a, in a bottom-up way, so from bottom, from grassroots initiatives, to regions, and then to federal government. Uh, secondly, this is the idea of diversity, so preserving all kinds of uh, non-discriminatory ways of uh, uh, finding compromise between different kinds of uh, minorities, be it gender minorities, ethnic minorities, religious minorities. And by the way, it might be of interest for your viewers to know that in Russia we have lots of Muslims, but also lots of Buddhists as well. And also uh, we do have people who are who proclaim themselves to be pagans. So along with Orthodox Christians, we enjoy huge level of religious diversity. So it's indeed important for Russia, for Russian constitution to proclaim non-discriminatory attitude towards all these religions. And uh, thirdly, that's the idea of trust. Trust uh, understood as as a political value in terms of citizens uh, maintaining this self-governance institutions on the municipal level initially, and then organizing through this uh, self-governed uh, municipal bodies, uh, things like uh, local educational system or municipal police, which is now highly centralized in Russia, things like that. So three things, trust, self-governance, and diversity and non-discrimination. And when you were browsing those principles and values, you know, what was your inspiration for choosing these ones? I would say that my inspiration comes from my uh, hikes and uh, trips and whatever uh, across Russia. I've, I've been traveling. When I was a student in Moscow State University, I've been traveling lots of times all around Russia from Baikal Lake to Kaliningrad, and I've seen that lots of people are actually capable to handle their own business themselves, provided that they are not stripped of their powers by often corrupted central authorities or by often corrupted uh, police authorities unaccountable to local citizens. So this is the main inspiration, uh, the, the need that was very often uh, voiced by Russian people for much greater accountability of local and regional authorities. And besides that, there are also some theoretical assumptions, because I'm a philosopher and theorists, uh, in a way, are important for me. So I'm very much in line with those kinds of theorists proclaimed by Philip Pettit or other thinkers in the field of political philosophy who say that it is indeed very much uh, important to find proper balance between community and individuality in politics. So doing something together uh, does not mean ignoring individuals. It means bringing them together in a meaningful way. So this is mainly what our constitution is about, how to bring individuals with, with all their diversity together in a meaningful way. I can also confirm what you said, because I was also traveling in Russia. And many times I ask people, like, why those things are not done here? Why why you don't have this and that, you know? Because Moscow and Russia, that's two different perspectives, right? That's the same system like in the United States, where you have in New York and the United States, you know? And many times I got the answer, but we need someone from Moscow to sign the papers and send us the money and, uh, and, and adjust the budget and all those things. And I said, like, but it must take ages, you know, because Russia is so big. So diverse, you know, Russia. I think in many in many way, in many ways, Russia is not understood in the West properly in terms of the territory. Uh, 
Because I think many people think that Russia is like one country. But when you travel across Russia, you know, it's like many countries in one country. And in many ways, the system of living, local traditions and laws are very diverse. You know, So I think that's, that's quite interesting that you were able to blend this perspective, this point of view into the drafting. It's, uh, that's something I think political philosophers might think about in a, in a very positive perspective. The, the next question I have is about English use in the draft. And it's given the centrality of the value of civil self-governance, the draft uses the term republic instead of state. And my question is, Russia has been building that sort of image of being a strong, independent state with own foreign policy and everything is based on state. And suddenly we have a republic. So what's the goal of this formulation of including republic into the draft? Well, you were already uh, having the clue since, well, indeed, Russia tends to represent themselves or boost itself as as a strong national or sovereign state, and sometimes at the expense of its own citizens, especially those ones who live far away from Moscow and are obliged to do all this paperwork you just mentioned in order to handle something. So that's precisely the idea. I mean, uh, it's not about uh, dissolution of Russia, although there are some people, not only among uh, Russian emigre scholars, but also in the West, who are saying that that is probably the best solution. What I would disagree with that is, in my perspective, uh, there is not that much people in Russia who actually believe in the need of dissolution. But what we're, what we're actually having right now is the understanding that Russia is hyper-centralized, one-way, one-dimensional uh, state. I mean, all flows, all roads are coming to Rome, which is Moscow. And this is unacceptable because, indeed, the level of diversity is, is so great. And this is why... The idea of republics, of res publica, common cores, doing something together where it happens, on the municipal level, on the regional level, is, is actually what is behind this change in terms. So it, it is not in, in, in it was not done in terms of advocating kind of dissolution current Russia. However, I, uh, as you probably uh, understood, or we're not uh, excluding the possibility of some regions of Russia uh, to to succeed to, to to leave the federation, which is also possible. But yeah, in in a way, it's just the other way of uh, addressing uh, uh, the norms and the values uh, are which we would like to use to create our political coexistence. Maybe we can even use the, the word commonwealth if it was not appropriated by, by the Brits. But it's also a good word here. I mean, understand that something needs to be done within the uh, sphere of commons, which is not necessarily uh, connected to creating over-centralized uh, institutions somewhere far away in Moscow. And that transition from state to republic how realistic in time-wise that could be done? Uh, well, the, the, the idea of writing constitution at that moment when Russia invaded, uh, invaded and still invading Ukraine and Putin regime is still in power is, is overtly or openly uh, unrealistic. However, I'm not... It is not to say that we shouldn't do unrealistic things. I mean, we should dare to imagine something that comes after that. So in a way, Republic is not what we're having today. And this is clear. Today, we're having state, very obsolete and old fashioned, hyper centralized state. And we have to envision the futures as, as, as we're saying from the very start in our draft, right? We have to envision kind, different kinds of futures, not one future, not the future, but lots of different futures. And this is, uh, so it, it, it is probably not that time-wise. I'm not, I'm not ready to say that this will happen in five years from now or so, 
but we definitely can and should reflect on this right now. Is it possible to use any of the current infrastructure in terms of legal system to build the republic, or you would change everything from scratch? Well, I would say that Russia's advantage is the very uh, good level of our, our digital services, and at the level to digital broadband connection is also very high. So. Uh, Probably your students know that Russia is one of the uh, uh, countries that are enjoying uh, uh, homegrown uh, social media. So most Russians, they're not using Facebook or Instagram or even uh, WhatsApp. They're using uh, homegrown uh, messengers and social media like uh, Contact or Telegram, which is also widely known across the globe. And I would say that these kinds of... Uh, digital services, uh, in a way, they plant the seed for a Republican uh, future. Because Russian citizens, they actually much more digitalized, I would say, as compared with, with the citizens of many, uh, many Western European countries, right? And in a way, we can use this uh, resource, this power accumulated by digital services, including those services that are operating as non-governmental organizations, like charity foundations, for example, and repurpose this power in terms of reforming uh, uh, state institutions. I think in many ways, it's always good to use what's working or what is working at the moment. And there are things working in Russia, despite, you know, the situation what's at the moment. But, but you know, it's good to use at least some fragments and, and then maybe to, to go further. From my, from my perspective, one of the issues I had in Russia was the, the acceptance or the respect of the institutions. So when I spoke with younger people, all of them, they had no clue about almost any institutions in Russia. They struggled. So I think this might be one of the areas to promote the institutions as something that Russia, Russia need, needs, you know, working institutions, not the official ones that are just following, you know, what's, uh, what's written in, in, in a top-level place. And probably that's also one of the motivations, uh, my personal motivations uh, standing behind this uh, uh, project is for, for the recent years when I've intentionally resigned from my uh, professoriate in, in, in the higher school of economics, which is a top tier university, I've been teaching in private schools. And what I've been doing with my kids, with, with my students, is actually developed in class, developing in class constitutions. So we've been developing our own constitutions, a set of rules how to how we're going to handle our lessons, how we're going to handle our classroom management. And that was very much uh, important for me. That was very inspiring for kids because th this is the only way that you're kind of uh, uh, getting accustomed to the idea that institutions, that it's something that is not far away, institutions are actually very close to you and you can have a say in developing these institutions in your own school in your own yard, in your own uh, neighborhood, things like that. So for me, developing constitution, despite the fact that it's obviously very speculative project, it's still very much connected to this uh, like grid of local initiatives, very much focused and centered on problems and issues people are having down there on the ground, on the floor. So this is the, the, the alpha and omega. So this is the starting point and the end as well. Russia has two courts. The first one is the Constitutional Court of Russian Federation. And the second one is the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation. The draft of your constitution is calling to abolish the former one, the Constitutional Court of the Russian Federation. Why? Uh, I, I, uh, disclaimer, I should say that lots of legal scholars are criticizing me precisely for that, for abolishing constitutional court. And the reason is that the current constitutional court is not defending political rights of citizens. So it is more or less doing its job in terms of defending 
social and economic rights. But when it comes, for example, for uh, the right of assembly, things like that, during the last years, Constitutional Court actually did nothing to defend all those people who were persecuted and imprisoned for just doing local politics, let alone uh, uh, doing politics on a wider scale, like Alexei Navalny or some other people, right? So in a way, uh, not talking about dissoluting everything at once, we've already mentioned that, I would say that there are some parts of the current uh, system that should be dissoluted because they're so closely associated with impunity and out and out, uh, outright ignorance in terms of rule of law that they there is no way other than to dissolute them. And the Constitutional Court is obviously one of those uh, institutions most closely associated with this band of uh, of law to the will of, of, of one man. So after that, the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation will take over the role of the Constitutional Court? Yes, exactly. That's that's okay. that's the point uh, in the current draft to, to give uh, Supreme Court uh, judicial, the power of judicial review and the power also to command on uh, on laws to assess whether they are uh, in, in line with what is said in Constitution or not. So let's go through some details that I I pick up as a as an international law hobbyist, you know. So Article Eight. Russia is a secular republic. No religion is or may be declared to be the state religion. No religion may be prohibited. So considering the tradition of the Orthodox Church and Jewish people in Russia, we speak about that Jewish autonomous oblast, you know, the region. Why is this point important? Why is it important to be non-religion as, as a republic? And how does this change might affect people or might be received by people who are at the moment very used to that there is Orthodox Church as a, basically the second power in Russia. Uh, well, I, I would disagree with you in terms of how much confidence people actually put in, in Orthodox Church. So it's not the case that we're having like Theocracy, <laughs> the combination of the secular and religious power is not the case. And in fact, most of people who even proclaim themselves to be Orthodox Christians, they attend their churches probably once or twice a year. And besides, actually, the current Russian constitution of 1993 is already proclaiming Russia to be a secular state. So it's not an innovation in terms of law. It's actually the year uh, we, we're, we're already having a constitution which is openly proclaiming Russia to be a secular state. So that's that's not a kind of so that's basically in tradition. That's basically more a clarification yeah. of the statement. Yeah, because this is what we receive, you know, like if there is something happening in Russia, Orthodox Church is always the second as mentioned. So so therefore I think it's also important for students and international audience to explain the real position of Orthodox Church in Russia, because this is something we don't have that many, you know, papers or articles about. Yes, uh, and it should be also remembered that uh, uh, during Soviet times, lots of uh, Orthodox uh, clergy were openly or uh, silently collaborating with KGB. So uh, Orthodox Church is, in a way, very much is very much controversial in terms of its its legacy, right? Its Soviet legacy. So, in a way, I I, I would disagree with the fact that uh, our, the unity or or the, the how how the how the power would like to brand itself as as truly orthodox is actually helping them to build their course because lots of people uh, on the ground they perfectly remember how. Orthodox Church, uh, Orthodox clergy was collaborating with with KGB powers, and in a way, there is not that much trust towards uh, Kirill himself or other high-ranking officials within the ranks of uh, Orthodox Church. So, and and besides that, as we've mentioned before, there are lots of people who are Muslims or Buddhists. So, for them, Kirill is not 
in authority at all. I think with this constitution, there's going to be sort of a new identity for Russia. So I think if in case this is implemented, the position of the Orthodox Church, the Muslim people, Jewish people and other, is going to be more balanced instead of having Orthodox Church as the only one always, you know, promoting by, by local media and people, especially politicians. Uh, yeah, but uh, I would say that actually federal media, uh, they, they also promote, they, they promote the, the idea that all religions are standing behind our president. So normally yes. what, what, would see, what you would see is like Putin alone uh, patriarch Kirill, but also representatives of Muslim denominations and Buddhists as well, and so on. So it's not the case uh, that like, there is some special uh, link between uh, state power and Orthodox Church only. State power is trying to uh, manipulate with religious feelings of all confessions, all denominations. And basically, this is the idea of our draft. So to not to impose any kind of secular obligations on people's religious beliefs, on the one hand, and on the other, stop this corrupted practice of making connection ties with religious authority, between religious authorities and state body. Article 19. Everyone has the right to a vital minimum of affordable and safe energy. How, how affordable is energy for Russians at the moment? Uh, well, ru energy is more affordable in Russia as it is in uh, OECD countries, for example, many OECD countries. But the thing is that during the, the last years, uh, uh, people are paying more and more for their bills. <laughs> and obviously, uh, the, the time of cheap energy are now gone for Russians. And this is why we're having these kind of provisions in our constitution, along many other social and economic rights. For example, the right for housing, and the right for education, and the right for palliative care. So thinking in terms of the future, uh, in the context of our current global environment crisis, it's, it's, it is indeed important to have in the constitutional law these kinds of provisions. And, and, and this is, I would say, the, the inevitable for for many other countries to amend probably their constitutions in order to include these kind of provisions, having global warming, uh, aging of their populations, and stuff like that in place. Once I participated in a debate um, at the Chapman House in London, and the topic was about uh, energy security, and because of Chapman House rule, I can't reveal who was there. But what I can reveal was there was a question about the Western European energy security. And the speaker said, but do you care about my energy security as a Russian citizen? And that was, you know, a very, very good question because I think, you know, that we take as automatic that Russian people will use gas, oil and whatever, whatever they have for energy, but it's not at all. And especially when you travel through Russia, you can see many areas where there is no natural gas. You know, it's it's like people are cut off the energy grid. It's not automatic at all. And also, when you go to Gazprom website, the Russian website, you can see many many projects. You know, being implemented in southern area, in the eastern area, northern areas. But we don't have any statistics how many people actually have access to energy, and gas and electricity later re renewable energy. So I would say energy security is not only the topic for the West, but it's a huge topic for Russia itself. Just my personal you know, remark, that observation I, I, I have. Let's jump to Article 23. The Constitution protects academic freedom, including freedom of teaching at universities and vocational educational institutions, freedom of academic research and exchange of ideas and results, freedom of academic press. This is a very hot topic at the moment because we can see many professors in Russia fled Russia. You know, they, they basically went away. They escaped the regime. 
Some of them, they stayed because of usually family circumstances. Not everyone can just go to America or the Western Europe, you know. It's not that easy as we think because, because we, we don't have the real perspective how Russian professors are teaching, what sort of payment they receive, you know, what sort of conditions they have for work. So is it even possible to protect academic freedom in Russia? And with a new constitution, how this could be implemented in practice? Uh, well, first, I would agree that for lots of people who are working in higher education institutions or vocational institutions, they're underpaid and their conditions are mostly miserable. So it's indeed really hard for them to address these issues of academic freedom because they're struggling with their day-to-day -day survival. Uh, so in a way, uh, drafting these kinds of provision in our constitution is just the first step. Uh, but it, it is a very important step because I would say maybe in a slightly utopianist way that it is important for people to know that no one can or would interfere in what they're doing as researchers and teaching. So this is a kind of basic respect towards those people who are doing really important jobs and education is obviously an important job. So in, in a way, this is not only political, but also social right of teachers. Know that no one would interfere into what I'm doing. Uh, but obviously, and I would agree with you that uh, just having this kind of provisions constitution is not enough. And that should be uh, the matter for to address for, for future Russian government, how we're going to change or how we're going to reform uh, the whole education system in Russia. And, and please forgive me for not having <laughs> really elaborated answer to that question right now, because indeed, that's, that's a very complicated topic, I agree. It is. Just, just for the perspective of, of my viewers and students, when you were working as a teacher at the university, Let's take the same position that you had in Russia and compare with the same position in the Netherlands. I'm not asking about the money, but let's say percentage. How, how many more percent in terms of payment do Western professors have in comparison with Russians? Yes, well, there are two basic points. The teaching load for Russian professors is much higher. So they normally teach much more classes per week than their Western counterparts. And the difference in terms of uh, like payment grades, it, it, it's it's like ten or fifteen times higher for Western professors. So it's 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 indeed considerable, really huge difference in terms of payment and uh, also teaching loads. That's 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 good to good to know because we also know that when we're speaking about the money, we must consider the cost of living. But when you live in Moscow, that's basically the same system like London, Paris, or Berlin, you know. It's not like in Moscow you can buy the cheap meat and cheap product. That's that's the only fiction. Moscow is super expensive city. And I would compare Moscow with New York, uh, London, and those in those mega cities in, in the West, you know. So the cost of living is the same or even higher. And there are also international rankings, you know, where you can see where Moscow is placed in terms of the cost of living. So you can even compare and then put this into the equitation, what uh, Peter said about having 10 times more as a payment for, for the same job. So thanks for, for this clarification, Peter. Article 39. Every person born on the territory of the Republic is a citizen of the Republic. This goes slightly against the tradition of Europe, where we have jus sanguinis, since the draft is proposing jus soli, which is more common in the United States. Why is this? Well, there's actually jus sanguinis as well, because uh, all those people who are having at least one of their parents born in Russia will also receive Russian uh, citizenship. So in a way, this just uh, we're trying to introduce as much... Uh, freedom in terms of accepting or refusing your citizenship as we can. I mean, so the Constitution draft is accepting both the right 
of blood used mm -hmm. in Guinness and the right as soil. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and is the is one priority or both of them are going to be in balance way? Well, in my view, that's going to be a balance. I mean, no, no one should be prioritized over another. That's also interesting to know because of the demographics of Russia. We know that Russia is losing citizens or, or people very badly in the recent decades, you know. So Russia basically needs much more people than it currently has. So that, that's a good point to have in the Constitution for people who want to become Russian citizens. Article 57. The budgets of local authorities shall be subject to an independent financial audit at least once every five years, involving representatives of local community who are not members of any local or public authority at the time of the audit. Who is going to audit those budgets? We know that each region in Russia represents slightly adjust regulations at the moment, depends who is in power. So basically, what's the point of this? Do you want to have like one institution which is going to control the local budgets or you want sort of like international review by the, you know, prestigious international companies or how is this going to be? Well, as, as we've said many times, uh, Russia is, is really diverse in terms of uh, its regions and we do have some rich regions that could hire Ernst and Young or whatever that might be to do this kind of any big five company to do the audit. So that might be the case. But we've been thinking, like, that should be the matter for, for people to decide. So whether they'd like to hire international consultants, okay, they can do that. Uh, or whether they can do this on their own, it's fine. So that's it's up to the people to decide. There might be lots of options here. But the goal is to move Russia out of the shadows to the transparency. Am I correct? Exactly. The, the overall premise behind this particular article and many other articles dedicated to financial matters is to move, uh, is to make tax system, for example, a financial system of regions and local authorities transparent to each and every citizen. This Russia really needs because I think billions of dollars that's, that's basically going out of Russia without noticing. So, there is a concept of the federative treaty in the draft. And this is connected to particular regions of Russia. Can you please explain this concept, the federative treaty? What is it and why? Well, this concept is also stands in, uh, in connection with the current Russian constitution. So, in, in a way, uh, when uh, the current constitution was adopted in 1993, immediately or almost immediately after the dissolution of the USSR uh, was the assumption that, that Moscow at that moment was much weaker than it was before. And so in, in, in trying to handle the balance of power, the then president Boris Yeltsin introduced this idea of federative treaties as a way of uh, curtailing the, 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 the sovereignties of all these emerging uh, Russia regions like Chechnya or Tatarstan or like whatever that might be, or Ural's Republic, some, something like that. But uh, uh, what we are saying in our draft is actually that we should stop being afraid of uh, people deciding whether they want to be in one country or not. Uh, lots of people, and we've already said that, there is lots of people, including some experts, that are saying that Russia would or could dissolute in the near future. I would disagree with that, because, and probably you too, since you've traveled in Russia, most of people, they never talk about, despite the fact that they're really uh, sometimes annoyed by the paperwork they're doing for Moscow, but not that many of them are really thinking about leaving Russia at all, because we do have economic and cultural and family ties within Russia, so it, it is almost unthinkable just to like, dissolute it. But it, what we do need is to rethink or reimagine the way of connecting this huge country. 
And federative treaty is a way of explicitly setting the bunch of rules for these types of connections, not just a hidden uh, plays of bulldogs under the carpet, <laughs> not something that is completely uh, silenced or explained away from the public eye, but something that is being done openly and something that is being done uh, in a way uh, that people, uh, wherever they leave, can have their say in. So this is what stands uh, behind this idea of federative treaty. Coming from European countries, people might know that when you have a republic, there is prime minister as a, as a main role who is basically leading the government. Russia also has prime minister, but the role is completely different at the moment. But what sort of role is that constitution draft counting with when it comes to president? Because at the moment, we know the president has, as you said, you know, it's too much space in constitution. Let's put it in this way. So the republic is a different system. So the president in the new draft, would this be more a representative role or do you count with any other principle for president? Well, this is why there is no uh, such institute as presidency in this draft. That's and correct. This is the second, that's the second major innovation in this draft, along with the dissolution of the constitutional court. So precisely because we're thinking about a certain type of parliamentary republic, whereas indeed the role of prime minister as the leader of uh, election winning party is, is much more important. Hmm. So, so there will be no Russian president? There will be no Russian president, right? <laughs> That's a good way to put it for, for clarification. So the main person will be the prime minister, the government as a government as we know from Europe and and that's it for the for the main power for, yes and that, civic assembly as, as yes. the federal legislative body right okay that's that's big one that's a big innovation because I think many people can't imagine the life like without Russian president like where is Russian yes president? And, and even uh, uh, some legal scholars both in Russia and outside Russia they also harshly criticize our draft for a completely <laughs> Right. Explain in a way this is, but this is indeed important for us. Just, just to 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 say goodbye to the very idea of Russia always having a strong man or a woman, whatever that might be, in power. So yes, we should have to say goodbye to that. I see. Good. What what about foreign policy and this constitutional draft? Uh, what sort of principle, the philosophical principle, do you want to apply? Well, this is mainly uh, the idea of peaceful uh, coexistence of, of Russia. And actually, m m uh, we've borrowed this uh, from German constitution that the, that the federal minister of defense should only be uh, someone who is not serving as, as an army officer or as a general, precisely because it should be uh, arm, armed forces should be presided by someone who is not a military person himself. Uh, I, I doubt that constitution should be really uh, prolific in terms of regulating even slightest details of, of foreign affairs, because it's mainly it's, its main focus is uh, certainly national politics. But our general vision which is, uh, I would say, clearly expressed in the draft, is the idea that Russia should be uh, holded, uh, sh should be responsible for all crimes against humanity that were committed during the uh, Russian invasion in Ukraine and beyond that, during any other Russian operations, military operations, in the world. But this is, uh, I would say, this is not an innovation. I mean, th that's the same for, for the United States or any other country which is committing crimes all over the world. So it's, it, it shouldn't be regarded as something new, actually. I mean, this is something that is a common sense of international relations. If you do something in, 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 in your backyard or in, in the foreign country, you should be held accountable for that. 
this should be the norm. And our draft is firmly on this position. So no smuggling your problems to some other regions of the world. No, no uh, to pretending that we're not doing anything wrong ever. So yeah, we, sh we should do international politics in a more transparent way. And again, I would imagine the lots of people both inside and outside Russia would say that we're too utopian or idealist to that matter, but still it is important for us to have this, this kind of ideas. Symbols and national flag, national anthem, all those belong to Russian identity. So the new constitution, how would the new constitution treat those symbols of Russia? Uh, again, this is for, for citizens, for a constitution conventional, uh, convention to decide. So according to the current draft that stands at the concluding remarks, uh, after the dissolution of current uh, governing bodies, we're going to have elections for constitutional convention, which would adopt new Russian constitution and also would decide what kind of symbols, anthem, flag, citizens of Russia would like to, to have. Maybe the same, maybe something different. So it's up, up to people's vote uh, to decide. Some of my students ask uh, before this interview that the current constitution has also some provisions that are not implemented in practice. The new constitution has good provisions in, in many ways. What would be that informs mechanism? So that this constitution is going to be actually a life constitution among people, you know, fulfilled by people and implemented by people. Uh, this is a good point indeed. And thank you to your students who are really raising this point because it's, it's not enough to have good provisions and constitutions in order to be sure that things would change. Yes, but for me as an educator, the answer is uh, having having a good system of civic education, for example, in place. is obviously, constitution is important, but constitution goes hand in hand with all those institutions, both in terms of law enforcement and also in terms of education, in terms of uh, citizen empowerment that would produce long-lasting efforts. So as a teacher, as an educator, I'm mostly interested in developing uh, new forms of civic, civic education for for younger generations. And that would be uh, an important leverage in terms of uh, accomplishing the, the provisions that are currently in our draft. This draft of the Constitution is based on certain philosophical stream. The question is, are there any different drafts or are there any debates among Russian scholars either in Russia or outside of Russia about new constitution? Yes, they are. For example, there are lots of uh, more, so to say, conservative projects of constitution and lots of, uh, for example, recently Russian oligarch Konstantin Malafiev, together with some orthodox clergy, uh, uh, discussed the idea of uh, writing constitution that would be firmly in line with uh, New Testament amendments, so to say, like openly mention uh, God as the foundation of secular power as well. And there are also uh, lots of uh, liberal constitutions. And um, for example, uh, there is political party Yabloka in Russia. It, it developed its own constitutional project some three years ago. But I mean, there are lots of projects I, I would say that our project is probably much more homogeneous in terms of having uh, this emphasis of Republican philosophy. So indeed, it was important for us to have this uh, more or less unified philosophical uh, foundation behind the whole project. But surely that's not the only project. And obviously we're going to see even more of that kind, provided that Russia is indeed not that unified as it seems to be. So there is lots of people 
lots of uh, different worldviews and opinions. And of course, that's, that would be the job for, for the future constitutional convention to decide which provisions actually to accept from our draft and which provisions to accept from other emerging projects as well. The last question for today's interview. Uh, we know what's going on. We know what's going on in Ukraine and, and elsewhere in the world connected to Russia. Is it possible to reform Russia without having a new constitution? <laughs> of course, it is possible to reform, or it is at least it is possible to uh, to create a mutiny <laughs> without without making new constitution. But what is impossible without new constitution is uh, granting that all citizens of Russia would have their say in this process. So we have to say no to top-down ways of reforming Russia. This is what behind the constitution. And writing constitution is, of course, not only the only way of empowering citizens, but this is, in my view, one of those ways to develop bottom-up politics and policies for Russia and in Russia. Said Peter Safronov, guest researcher at the University of Amsterdam. Peter, thank you very much for being with us, for explaining those little details about the new constitution project. And I would say, you know, many years ago we heard that private company will never go to Mars or to the space. We see how the Elon Musk is doing. And I think for the skeptics of this project, it's always good to have some future plans, some future concepts, because Russia is, is a very interesting country. Russia is, is huge, it's diverse. And instead of focusing only on little details of the policies and projects, we should also have some holistic approach to Russia. One of these approaches is to have a new constitution as a project. Peter, thank you very much again. I, I wish you good luck with all the philosophical challenges with all the criticism coming from the legal experts and scholars. We know how the legal environment is, it's super competitive. So thank you again for joining us and good luck with all the projects. Thank you, Martin, it was my pleasure. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>